Uh, good morning and a very warm welcome to day two of FICI's 93rd annual convention and AGM. In exactly two hours from now, 11 a.m., we will have the Honorable Prime Minister of India addressing this convention, and we look forward to having all of you with us for that. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, let's get started with uh, the session one for today. I'm Neeraja Singh, Senior Director of FICI, and we will talk about a promise that's the future. This is a beautiful morning, and nothing feels better than starting your day with positivity, imaginations, and limitless possibilities for the future. Well, to fire up your morning with the mind-blowing ideas, and also take you to experience the abundance, we have an incredible leader who is going to change the way you think about the future. As he puts it, the future is now. Continue excitement as I invite President Fiki, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, to please welcome our guest speaker of this morning, Dr. Peter Diamandis. Namaste and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, good afternoon uh, from people from other parts of the world. So the Wright brothers brought us the ability to fly. Flying by the cosmic ocean was made a reality by Charles Lindbergh. And... Werner's born bronze rockets let man land on the moon. It was for our inspirational Peter, uh, speaker this morning, Dr. Peter Diamandis, who put imagination to thought and brought entrepreneurship to space travel. Peter created XPRIZE and offered $10 million in 2004, 16 years ago, for the first commercial space flight. Now that's what I call the power of imagination and going really bold. It's my honor and proud privilege to welcome a friend and someone who's been named by Fortune magazine as one among the world's 50 greatest leaders. Welcome to Fiki's 93rd AGM. Peter Diamandis. Fiki is the apex chamber of commerce in India that was launched on the advice of our beloved father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhiji, who also addressed the fourth AGM of FICI in 1931. Since inception, this platform has been uh, graced by several dynamic national as well as international leaders, and today we are most delighted to have you amongst us. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Diamandis needs no introductions. He is New York Times best-selling author of two books, Bold and Abundance. And I've read both his books, and I can tell you I don't remember the last time I had read something as impactful. With his degrees in molecular genetics and aerospace engineering from MIT and an MD from Harvard Medical School, Peter is the executive founder of Singularity University, a graduate-level Silicon Valley institution that counsels world's leaders on exponentially growing technology to tackle the world's biggest challenges and build a better future for all. His greatest gift, however, is his ability to get people and organizations to think boldly. And when they do so, he believes, and I believe too, that abundance is created. In this virtual room today, we have thousands of delegates uh, the actual number is 3,860, um, uh, primarily entrepreneurs and CXOs whose decision-level making people who've been waiting to benefit from this vast knowledge and experience of a man who believes that the best way to predict the future is really to create it yourself. So here's to a great future for all of us. Please put your hands together for Dr. Peter Diamandis. Peter, the floor is yours. Dr. Reddy, a pleasure, and thank you for your friendship, and thank you for your invitation. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I've been to India dozens of times, and I love the nation. It's a nation uh, filled with, uh, with intelligence and youth and extraordinary, the most, the most important resource of all, imagination and passion and intelligence. So uh, I believe that we're living during the most extraordinary time ever in human history. And despite the COVID-19 pandemic, which has hit so many financially and health wise, it's also accelerated us in an extraordinary way. And I hope in the next 15 minutes during this address and then the questions that follow, I help you understand why I think this is the most extraordinary time ever to be alive. And I'll ask you to remember that the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. So as I speak to entrepreneurs, 
know, I define entrepreneurs as people who find great problems and solve them. And that resource of finding problems and solving problems makes the world a better place. And the other comment I make to those I teach at Singularity and at Abundance 360 is if you want to become a billionaire, help a billion people. That's what's possible today. We're living in a day and age where an individual now has the power to change the world. So this year, I've been very focused on, on a key concept I want to share. If I were to ask you, you know, uh, look at the top uh, entrepreneurs and leaders out there, looking at the work of a Bill Gates, a Ratan Tata, Mukesh Ambani, and Elon Musk, a Jeff Bezos, a Steve Jobs, what led them to succeed? Was it the money they started with? Was it the technology they started with? Or was it their mindsets? I would say that the mindset of a true leader, a true visionary, is the most important asset that they have. Um, you take away everything from those leaders and you leave their mindsets and they would re retake all that they lost. And so the challenge is that very many, very few of us actually take the time to actively choose and develop the mindsets that are going to benefit us all. And I've been focused on four mindsets. I'd like to share them with you. And they are in the context of the exponential world that we're living in. Uh, the first mindset is an exponential mindset. And the challenge is that we as humans evolved hundreds of thousands and millions of years ago in a world that was local and linear. Back 100,000 years ago, nothing affected you that was not within a day's walk. And, and things did not change century to century or millennium to millennium, things were constant. And our brains, the 100 billion neurons in our brain, the 100 trillion synaptic connections that shape all of our thoughts, our brains evolved for that world. But today we're living in a world that is global and exponential. Something happens on the other side of the planet, you know about it seconds later. Your computers know about it microseconds later. Things are not changing decade to decade or year to year, they're changing month to month, sometimes day to day. And so that's a challenge for us because our brains are not wired exponentially. The only way I know to think and create an exponential mindset is really to constantly be updating yourself on this is now possible, this is now possible, this is now possible. You know, in the exponential world, if you double something 10 times, it's a thousand times better. Double it 20 times, it's a million times. Double it 30 times, it's a billion fold better. So when a guy named Steven Sasan at Kodak Labs came up with the first digital camera and he walked into the boardroom of Kodak and said, here it is, the future of Kodak. It's a digital camera. It takes 0 0.01 megapixel images. The board of Kodak laughed at him and said, you're kidding me. That's a toy for kids. We're Kodak. We make beautiful high resolution images. And he said, you know, besides, we're in the paper and chemicals business. And and Kodak as a company, which was a global dominant brand, even though they invented the digital camera, they didn't understand the power of exponential growth. The first year was 0 0.01 megapixels. The next year was 0 0.02, 0 0.04, 0 0.08. It all looked like zero. But 30 doublings later, it was a billion times better and Kodak was bankrupt. So we have to understand that these technologies are growing at extraordinary rates. And we have to understand where they're going. Now, the benefit of an exponential mindset is to realize that whatever you can digitize, and we digitize photography, we're digitizing finance and medicine and manufacturing, everything, whatever you digitize enters a period of slow, deceptive growth. That first digital camera, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.04, very deceptive, but eventually becomes disruptive and it dematerializes demonetizes and democratizes products and services, right? The, the digital camera has dematerialized into our cell phones over here. And these cell phones have on them millions of dollars of free apps, right? That are now demonetized and available to everyone around the world and therefore democratized. And so when I speak to entrepreneurs, my, my challenge is your job is to to digitize, demonetize, and democratize. And when you can do that, it uplifts the world because all of a sudden, 
the best technologies in the world are effectively free. We're heading towards a world where we truly are dematerializing, demonetizing, and democratizing almost every product and service. So an exponential mindset is truly understanding as a, as a leader, as an entrepreneur, how do you think exponentially and how do you digitize to create a world of increasing capabilities? The result of exponentials and exponential mindsets are, is a world of abundance. And I believe we're heading towards a world where there is nothing truly scarce, where we're heading towards a world where we can meet the needs of every man, woman, and child on the planet. So this was a realization for me when I started studying exponentials and started Singularity University. The realization is that almost anything we think of as scarce is becoming more and more abundant. So let's take a look at some of the areas, perhaps, in the field of energy. We used to go and kill whales on the ocean to get whale oil to light our nights. And then we ravaged mountainsides for coal. And then we started drilling kilometers under the ground to get oil. But we live on a planet that has 6,000 times more energy from the sun than we consume as a species in a year. And we're heading right now at a price of about 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour. We're heading towards a world where we're going to have a squanderable abundance of energy, where the majority of our energy will come from renewables, from solar, at the same time that new energy storage technologies come. And we end up with a world in which we're electrifying our fleets and electrifying every element. And a world of abundant energy means a world of abundant clean water. Uh, as Sangeeta said, I run the XPRIZE Foundation. We had an XPRIZE not long ago called the Water Abundance XPRIZE. And people talk about you know, water scarcity and water wars, and it's a real thing. Uh, but we live on a water planet. Our planet is two thirds covered by water. Yes, 97.5% is salt, 2% is ice on the caps, and we fight over half a percent. But it turns out, that there are quadrillions of liters of water in the atmosphere. And so we had an X prize um, that was funded by Shell and out of, uh, out, of, uh, out of Australia that asked teams to pull 2,000 liters of water out of the atmosphere every day from fully renewable energy. And it was one, two years ago. And so that kind of technology will begin to disseminate itself around the world. If you have abundant energy and abundant water, half the disease burden on the planet is due to unclean drinking water. These dominoes begin to fall. Now, in the abundance mindset, you know, you realize that we're not living on a planet that is a limited pie. And every time people become wealthier, you have to slice the pie into thinner and thinner slices. Instead, we're living into a world where we're gonna bake more pies. It's about creating more. It's not about distributing what we have into thinner and thinner pieces. We're heading towards a world where, you know, today, and Sangeeta, you and I speak about this, we're living in a world of sick care, not health care, a world where the world takes, you know, the system takes care of you after you're sick. But artificial intelligence will become the best diagnostician. And there are entrepreneurs today working on robots that will become the best surgeons. And the cost for an AI, a cost for a robotic surgeon, as we move towards the future is one where it's the cost of electricity and the capital expense. But let's talk about education. Uh, there's going to be a future where every child on the planet has access to the best teachers. Those teachers will be AIs, they'll be digitized teachers, they'll be AI and VR together. You know, I think about someone who wants to learn about the history of India. You know, we can learn about it in a schoolroom where, you know, half the kids are lost and half the kids are bored, or from a book perhaps that you read, or in the future, this is the convergence of exponentials. It's putting on a pair of VR goggles and stepping into a, a super high resolution AI driven uh, VR experience where you're talking to the earliest you know, founders of the nation and seeing it and having conversations and walking around and experiencing it. And an education that comes from experience versus reading is so much more lasting. 
So abundance is coming across in a very rapid fashion. I would posit that there is nothing that is truly scarce. Now, the other mindset that I teach and I'm excited about and that I'm spending a lot of my time investing in is a longevity mindset. You know, it used to be that on this planet 10,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago, we would get pregnant when we were 13. And by the time we were 26, our babies were having a baby. And back then, there was very little reason for the grandparent to stick around. In fact, it was, it was, a, uh, it was a negative to have someone stick around. The best thing you could do is not take food from your grandchildren's mouths. And so there was never any selection for people to live longer. I remember when I was in medical school, I watched an, an, a, a, a television show on long-lived sea life, that certain species of life on the planet, whales, bowhead whales, uh, Greenland sharks, could live 200, 300, 400, 500 years. And I remember asking, if they can live that long, why can't we? And the realization I had was it was either a software problem or a hardware problem. And we're beginning to understand those problems. And there are scientists and technologists today who are focused on the idea that aging is a disease and a disease that can be slowed, stopped, perhaps even reversed. Uh, a good friend, David Sinclair at Harvard Medical School just published a paper this uh, past week, the cover of, of Nature on um, epigenetic reprogramming in which he's been able to demonstrate reversing aging in complex systems. So we're heading towards a world where all of a sudden, not only can we hopefully this decade stop cancer and neurodegenerative disease, but also reverse the aging of individuals. And it's an extraordinary time to be alive. The last mindset that I talk about, and we can go into more questions, is the moonshot mindset that more important than ever, it's important for uh, entrepreneurs and for leaders and for um, really the, the global philanthropists to be taking big moonshots. Uh, a moonshot is defined as, uh, as going 10 times bigger when the rest of the world is going 10% bigger, right? Most of us are working on just 10% you know, more revenue, 10% more product, trying to make an incremental change where a moonshot is what is actually capable right now for entrepreneurs to dream much bigger. It's a thousand percent bigger and not 10% bigger. It's a 10 X improvement on what you're doing. And for me, as I said earlier, the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. So COVID-19 is here. We have this uh, pandemic going on. Uh, it is taken the world by storm. I think some of the lessons that I've taken away from the pandemic that I want to share is actually the speed at which the human race can react to a disaster. I remember in late February, early March, when everybody was, you know, our heads were spinning and we didn't know what was going on, but there was enough of a concern that hundreds of thousands of doctors and nurses and scientists and engineers from around the world focused on this singular problem. And all of a sudden, PPE and ventilators and vaccine companies came out of no place. I know for myself, we stood up a vaccine company, COVAX, and in 30 days, we had 30 vaccine candidates. And a month later, we had a primary one. And now nine months later, we're entering phase two. The speed at which we're able to innovate is shocking. And for me, that gives me the greatest hope, greatest hope for, for humanity. So I am someone who believes there is no problem that cannot be solved. And I really, to the entrepreneurs out there, my advice is find a great problem, one that fills you with passion, not, you're, not one you're doing for your mother or father or for your teacher. It's one that fills your heart, that gives you your clear purpose, your massively transformative purpose and then attack it as if a man whose hair is on fire seeks water. That's what's possible. Each of us have access to more computational power than any time ever that world leaders had 20 years ago. Access to more knowledge, access to more communication capability, 
access to more of almost everything. There is nothing more important than one singular thing, which is the passionate and committed human mind. And with that in focus, there is no problem which can stand up to our, our focused dedication. You know, uh, at the XPRIZE Foundation, I'll just mention, we're working on, we've launched about $150 million of XPRIZES. Our first one was for space flight. We have another $200 million in XPRIZES coming up. Um, we just launched this week an XPRIZE to feed the next billion people. Uh, it's an incredible prize. Uh, it's funded uh, out of Abu Dhabi and by one of the Silicon Valley billionaires and by Tony Robbins. And we've challenged teams around the world to build uh, chicken and fish as a protein from stem cells, right? For, this is cellular agriculture or from plants. And this chicken or fish needs to taste better, needs to be healthier, and it needs to be, you know, far less expensive with, you know, 90% reduction in, in greenhouse impact. And we expect that we're going to be increasing the amount of people going from extreme poverty to poverty to middle class, and they're going to want access to high quality protein. And we can't continue to, to feed the world as we had before. So this is an X prize we've launched. We're working on an age reversal X prize. We're working on an X prize to uh, predict and prevent the next pandemic. You know, at the end of the day, we're living in a world where, again, it's a matter of where do we want to focus our intention? Uh, I believe that this is the most extraordinary time ever to be alive. And I'm excited to uh, have a chance to share my passion with you. Um, and now uh, to have some questions from my esteemed colleagues here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. That was great. So without wasting a minute, we'll straight dive into question and answers. And my first question uh, will be from uh, Mr. Uday Shankar, President Elect Fiki. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much for that incredibly positive and optimistic uh, message first thing in the morning. I think all of us could do with that and the whole world could do with that. Uh, I, I just have a very specific question uh, on AI. You talked about AI emerging as the best diagnostician and solver of many other problems. It's also emerging as a major concern and threat for uh, people's lives and those who want to control people's lives, especially the hapless people. How does the world find a constructive framework in which to deal with AI? Dr. Shankar, it's a great question. So let me give you a few frames to think about this with. First of all, to the entrepreneurs listening, as I said, the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. So if you see a problem, flip it and say, okay, I'm going to dive in to see how I can solve it. Okay, that's, that's a simplistic answer. Um, the second answer is the concern about uh, technological unemployment, right? Losing your job to robots and AIs. So this next decade is one where I think it's going to be AI and human collaboration, probably in the next 10 to 15 years versus replacement. Uh, I think every leader, every CEO needs to be thinking about how do I get my top employees to begin utilizing, to partner with AI. Uh, there's a phrase that you want to auto automate the routine and, and humanize the exceptional. Right, so uh, Sangeeta knows this. I'm in the hospital setting where a, a doctor is too busy to go and, and talk to the patient, to the patient's family, because he or she is looking at the readouts and all of that. We need to humanize these things. It's taking the time to be human. And ultimately, I think it's a partnership in that regard. The other thing that's going on is we are demonetizing the cost of living. We're going to demonetize where the cost of electricity is plummeting, the cost of water, food, energy, healthcare, education. Um, uh, and that means that uh, we're going to, you know, a lot of people are doing work, the majority of people on the planet, I would say, are doing work not that they dreamed of doing when they were a kid. They're doing work to put food on their table, to be able to afford insurance. So, what happens in the future if we're able to separate the work we do for you know, for what we love to do versus income. 
So there will be elements of universal basic income that will begin to materialize as things become lower cost. But I agree, these are challenges. But uh, I remain an optimist in our abilities to, uh, to do this. If I were channeling Elon Musk, it's going to be the world of brain-computer interface, and it's going to be that we are merging with technology. It's not about AI versus humans. It's about AI versus HI. It's human and AI intelligence combined. Sure. Thank you, Peter. In, in, in the interest of time, what I would suggest is we ask all the three questions that we have for you, one after the other, and probably you could synthesize the answer together. For the next question, uh, let me invite Mr. Puneet Dalmiya, Managing Director, uh, Dalmiya Bharat Group, and after which I will request uh, Shravan Subramanian to ask his question, and then Upasna, and then Peter could respond to all of them together. Sure. Peter, thank you very much. Uh, it was a great uh, talk in a world full of possibilities, abundance, longevity, moonshots. I think it was very inspiring. Uh, the question I have is that, um, you know, while the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities, I think uh, in this world, aspirations are rising and um, everybody has access to YouTube, videos, WhatsApp, but the rich are rich getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. So I was reading two data points which, uh, you know, really, you know, surprised me. Mm -hmm. That the top 1% of the world's rich people have more than the bottom 50%. And recently in China, which has produced so many billionaires, if you are born in the bottom 10% of society, it will take you seven generations to come into median income. Mm. So the question I have is, what can technology do and what can rich people do to be more caring, more kind, and ensure that the standard of living of everybody in the world increases? Thank you. Great question. Next one, please. Uh, let's next, uh, our next question come from Shravan. Shravan, do, do you want to raise this? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Peter, that was fantastic. And I'm all about uh, looking at exponential opportunities. Um, and I actually work for a large company where uh, GE, where uh, quite often we are dealing with a lot of uh, prosaic concerns like quarterly budgets and headcount targets. Um, but while as leaders, we do have an entrepreneurial spirit that we're looking for the next uh, big one. Uh, what would you recommend as a talent strategy to spot the right people to drive innovation and run like their hair is on fire? Thank you. Thank you, Shravan. Uh, for the last question, I invite Upasna, who is the Vice Chairperson, CSR Apollo Hospitals, along with other responsibilities that you have. Upasna, please. Hi, Peter. I'm really intrigued by your longevity bit, and I wanted to know what are the key drivers for quality longevity? And what budget should one keep aside to achieve this? And, you know, this comes from an Indian who strongly believes in alternate healing and benefits of modern technology. May I ask one more question on longevity? Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Peter, the aspect of longevity, I was wondering, there is so much work done on genomics on one hand. And you have the artificial intelligence which speed up all the science work which is to be done. And what kind of prediction you have of combining these two stream of work coming together and what kind of major changes one would see in the management of health? Okay, um, Sangeeta, I'll ask for an extra hour here and <laughs> I'll dive in. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll, try and, I'll try and weave this together. So, uh, Puneet, the first question you asked, I think, is really important for me to answer because um, it used to be that for all of history, it was the king and the queen on the hilltop and everyone in severe poverty. That was the world for 99.99%. .99%. And then we have started, and it was, it was the, the, uh, the have and the have-nots. And we've started moving people up into the process, into higher levels. And yes, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. But I will say, I want you to frame this in a different way. We are heading from a world of have and have nots to a world of haves and super haves. And in my, the work that I'm doing, I, it's okay with me if there are trillionaires living on Mars, as long as everyone on earth has access to all the food, energy, water, healthcare, education that they need. So for me, it's about raising the floor 
so that individuals have all of their needs met, where a mother can know that her children have access to the best education and the best health care, and they can become whatever they can become. So it's not the gap, it's the floor that matters. And exponential technologies are rising, are raising that, that floor. Um, in terms of, of talent strategy, it really, the talent today, people, uh, young entrepreneurs are looking for purpose more than anything else. And so how do you create a company that's got such a massively transformative purpose that it is attracting people like, I have to go work there. That company is changing the world. It's not about the, you know, the, the uh, option package or the salary. It's like, I get to be part of this epic mission. And the best people are attracted to that epic mission. In terms of uh, quality longevity, it really is about health span uh, more than anything else. And ultimately, the, the phrase I am using is, how do we make 100 years old and use 60? At 100, how do we make sure we have the cognition where we're sharp, we have the, uh, the aesthetics uh, and the mobility that we had at 60. Now, there's, the realization is that science is rapidly accelerating exponentially. And if we're able to live an extra 10 or 20 healthy years, science doesn't stand still. It's accelerating and you're intercepting a whole new slate of technologies that are basically going to be uh, uh, transforming. So, you know, I, I think it's, it is about quality. It is about feeling great, it's about vitality, not just longevity. Um, and the budget, that's a challenge. Um, we are demonetizing, but retirement people are, you know, saying I need enough money to get me through 85 or 90. What happens if they live another 30 or 40 years? The answer is don't retire early. And in fact, the, the statistics are true, right? Especially for men. If you retire, you die on the average five years later. So if you, if you feel great about your life, you've got vitality and energy, you're not going to retire. You're going to want to remain uh, you run around to mean, uh, uh, like you're contributing and, and AI is going to change healthcare. Healthcare is going to move, uh, into the home, into the body. It's going to be not a visit once a year, which is sick care. It's going to be continuous where I'm monitoring everything all the time. And it's about optimizing your health and AI is going to become, you know, my, my, my doctor is going to, my, my personal AI, my version of Jarvis from Iron Man, if you know the movie, is going to be monitoring all my physiology, all of my sensors, you know, all of the time and telling me, you know, most of us are optimists about our health. We think we're fine until we have a pain in our side and we go to the hospital. And the fact of the matter is we should be able to scan ourselves constantly to understand what's going on. And at the very beginning of disease, zap it at the very start before it gets expensive, before it gets disastrous. Anyway, I think education and healthcare are the two biggest industries that AI and exponential tech is going to, is going to uh, transform. I also think India has an opportunity to be leaders across the board in every single one of these industries. Um, Sangeeta, I'm, I'm thankful for our friendship and our partnership. Thank you for inviting me. I know you have a full schedule and day ahead. Thank you for your time. So, Peter, that was tremendous. And for everyone, I know that you're continuously waiting to ask Peter more and to understand more about dematerializing, demonetizing, democratizing, and the whole abundance mindset. Let me just tell you a transformational moment in my life was when I attended Abundance 360. So, Peter, thank you. Uh, I, what struck me the most is that you continue to urge people to solve the world's biggest problems and that you find the greatest joy in mentoring future leaders. So thank you for what you've done today. You have ignited the future of abundance in our country through this talk. Thank you and namaste. namaste. Uh, move directly into the next session, ladies and gentlemen. So all of you who have logged in, please stay on. And everyone here, let's give a big hand to Peter Diamantis. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Amazing. Talk to you soon. Bye now.